Oh, but the classes will be quick. You can probably do them in a week. Not like the cleric is next or anything. We're rolling. <laughs> Great, um, settle in class. Today we'll be talking about the cleric. The ones who picked a god and prayed, then got untold magical blessings and a personal connection. Are you ready for a miracle? Cause gods know I'm gonna need one for this. Let's go. There are 14 types of clerics put into subclasses called domains. Those domains are important. They basically are the class. You get to choose at level one for a reason. But before we get into what divides them, let's figure out what they have in common. They're a divinely mandated magic user. And that's it thematically. The deity in question could give power to a non lever or an enemy or random chicken, while the figurehead of the church remains mundane. Not how it would normally go, but it can happen, assuming there's even a deity involved. According to Xanathar, it could come from a personal philosophy or a vague concept like being chaotic good. It does include healing magic though, both before and after the patient dies. They are among the best at it, the default, but they don't have to be a healer. There are plenty of other varieties, with battlefield control and buffing and even solid damage spells. They also have more exclusive spells in their cantrip section alone than most have in their entire list. And much of what's left is exclusive to them and the paladin or artificer. Giant variety, and all 14 of their domains get a set of 10 prepared automatically, potentially even ones they don't normally get. Don't assume anything about a cleric. There are too many ways they can turn out, or even that the same cleric can turn out, because they choose from every spell available when they prepare, so they can completely change how they work overnight. While they may be magic focused and only get simple weapons, they can take a hit pretty well. DA HP and proficiency with medium armor and shields, which is pretty good for a caster. They're proficient with wisdom and charisma, perfect for a priest, but again, you don't need to be one. At level two, you get something called channel divinity. The universal version is called Turn Undead and lets you make undead run away. Starting at once per day, but eventually becoming three a day, you get an additional way to use those charges depending on your domain. And starting at level five, it immediately destroys weak undead. At first, we're talking things like shadows or zombies, but by the end, we're looking at Banshee. Useful for carving up a horde of minions, but pretty situational to say the least, which is why I'll be bringing up an extra version of it with every subclass, which we can now talk about. Yeah, that's basically all they get as a class. The spellcasting and channel just get stronger over time. Well, that in divine intervention at level 10. Pray to your god. Your level is the percent chance that they'll care. If they do care, a cleric spell of the DM's choice is cast and you lose this ability for a week. If they don't, you can try again tomorrow. At level 20 it always works, but you do still have to wait. Yay! The meat of this class is the domain abilities gained at levels 1, 2, 6, 8, and 17. The cleric has the most kinds of all classes, as I'm sure you can see by the video length. So let's get cracking. We start off strong with Arcana, worshippers of knowledge and power. They're the divine version of the wizard. Their spell selection is taken straight from that list, with some great support options like Dispel Magic and Arcane Eye. You also get Arcana proficiency and take two cantrips from the wizard's giant list. I would personally go for utility like Mind Sliver or Prestidigitation, but no shame in grabbing Firebolt for things that resist your sacred flame. Though to be honest, you probably don't need it. Your channel divinity is basically turn undead for anything that resists your radiant damage. Arcane Abjuration. You can turn a Fey, Fiend, Celestial, or Elemental. And at level 5, you can banish them back to their home plane for a minute too. The CR of what's affected increasing like turn undead. So you basically take the one ability and make it affect 5 times as much. Phenomenal. At level 6, you can remove a spell effect when you heal someone. Works great with things like Healing Word. At level 8, you add your Wisdom modifier to Cantrip damage. Pretty cool if you've grabbed an AoE like Acid Splash. And at level 17, huge gap, I know. You get a wizard spell of level 6, 7, 8, and 9. Automatically prepared. Totally worth the wait. And thematic too. These are your scholars, your priests of arcane knowledge. Those who consider magic itself to be divine. For inspiration, I would ditch the whole keepers of sacred text thing and dig deep into mad scientist tropes, adventuring for more test subjects, and to learn untold secrets of a bygone age. Or be a bookworm, meek but wanting to travel to collect more books. Maybe you have a special interest you're adventuring to learn more about. Or you discovered a fragment of a secret long ago, and you're trying to find the rest of it. Make sure to get with your DM if you go that route. I'm sure they'll love the free plot hook with easy resolution. Speaking of the Dungeon Master, if you bonk them on the head and take their guide, you can get the Death Domain. They're mainly meant to be a head cultist or such, but they're fine to use normally. They've got a great offensive suite of spells like Blight and Cloud Kill. They've also got proficiency with martial weapons and can grab a necromancy cantrip off any list. I would suggest Chill Touch, mainly because if there's two enemies in range and they're next to each other, you can attack them both with the same necromancy cantrip. Situational, but really useful, and especially at level 17, when that applies to all single targets 
Blight spells fifth level or lower. Double Blight is wild if you can pull it off. Their Channel Divinity is a burst of necrotic damage by plus twice your level. It's not bad, but not really great for the cost. On the bright side, level 6 lets you ignore resistance to necrotic damage, and at level 8, you can do your best Joe Cat impression and do the spooky slice, adding necrotic damage to your weapon once per turn. All in all, this is a cleric with a clear focus on dealing damage. You can play this straight and go full edgy, your abilities are all named things like inescapable destruction after all, but you don't have to go that route. They're concerned with death, but you could focus on the doctor angle, taking and giving life on a whim, giving them a god complex, or simple morbid curiosity. A doctor who's long lost their medical license, bringing back the dead and making their teammates question if they can really trust their magic. You can go with a mortician or a grave tender, bringing back those that they tend to and adding to their ranks. But if you're wanting the spooky flavor without all the undeath, or you're just looking for a more defensive support, I would suggest the grave domain. While death is focused on causing death and undeath, grave is focused on making sure the dead stay that way. Played straight, these are your vampire hunters, ghost detectives, and grave tenders. You can even detect the undead a few times a day. Their spells are mostly defensive, like death ward, but you also get magic to reverse death like revivify. Furthering that theme, you get spare the dying for free and can cast it at a range of 60 feet. Even better, when someone's at 0 HP, you automatically do max healing. That means that sometimes it's a legitimately good strategy to beat your teammate unconscious with a shovel before you heal him. Ah, catharsis. And speaking of attacking, your channel divinity curses a target, making them vulnerable to the next attack. Combine that with a big spell or smite, and you can shred a boss, which combos well with your level 17 ability, letting you heal an ally when someone dies. The more hit dice they had, the stronger the heal. At level 6, you turn an enemy crit into a normal hit a few times a day, and at level 8, you add your wisdom modifier to damage, just like the Arcana domain. You're gonna see that a lot. It's basic, but solid. We basically got a combat medic. They're not here to make you fine and dandy, they're here to keep you alive. It's a small but vital distinction. Now you can play this as a gravekeeper, of course, trying to keep you alive to avoid more paperwork. And again, the unethical doctor works great, especially when you're beating a teammate unconscious for that better heal, of course, not at all revenge for constantly yelling medic while building a turret on the back line. You could also go a more taskmaster or commander route. You can die when I say you can die. Get up, you have more work to do. Wait, that means you could be that manager. You know the one, the guy who would call you at the hospital to see if you can come in tomorrow. Because yeah, you're on med leave for surgery and like you told me two months ago, but I forgot and scheduled you anyway. I thought you were a team player. Except this one's actually ripping your coffin open to bring you back. Okay, wow, forget about death. I think this one might be the evil one. Um, anyway, we move from the weaknesses of flesh to the strength and certainty of the forge. Their given spells are mostly from other classes, based on the creation and manipulation of items, and also fire. Plenty of fire. You get heavy armor proficiency and smithing tools, so plate mail time. You can also turn one armor or weapon into a plus one magic version whenever you wake for the day. Pretty great for level one. And at level two for your channel divinity, you can make anything you want that's a hundred gold or less, as long as even part of it is metal. Just plonk down the cash in a circle, and you can have it in an Hour. Better yet, you can also just use scrap metal as long as it's worth enough or you make up the difference with money. Just dump everything metal you don't want to carry in a circle and turn it into a bar of gold or mithril or something. And it doesn't say how big of an area your laid out items count in, so just dump all the furniture and loose gear in a pile and leave no loot behind. Maybe I'm just biased being an artificer, but this is easily my favorite version of Channel Divinity. At level 6, you resist fire and get plus 1 AC from heavy armor. That turns to fire immunity at level 17, with resistance to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slash attacks while in heavy armor, and your level 8 is dealing extra fire damage with weapon attack once per turn. Just like the Death Cleric, this is your other trend for level 8. You're either dealing your Wisdom mod on cantrips or thematic damage on your weapon. Depends on how much they expect you to be in melee, which you probably will be as a Forge Cleric. That heavy armor lets you be on the front line, dealing damage and throwing out utility and control magic. Now of course the Angry Blacksmith is going to be the go-to for this class, especially for Dwarves, but might I interest you in a Clockmaker or a Silversmith, a Jeweler? Anyone who deals with metal works fine in this class. Make a flamboyant artist who smelts down every layer, turning rusted metal and torture implements into sculptures to beautify the world and mark your deeds. An environmentalist could turn weapons of war into habitats, or be an armorer who knows how to use their product. And yeah, the devotion to metal crafting is pretty inherent, but most professions use metal. If nothing else, they're gonna need someone for maintenance, and that knowledge for upkeep and repair can make them a forge cleric. Knowledge in general, however, would make them a knowledge cleric. Basically the more mundane version of an arcana cleric, they just care about truth, true to their added magic, which is all about 
getting or hiding info from identify to non-detection. You also learn two languages, choose two from a list of knowledge-based skills, and add double proficiency to those skills. For your channel, you can give yourself proficiency with a tool or skill for 10 minutes, and if that's not enough for you, at level 6 you get another version that lets you try to read a creature's mind and give it a suggestion. Level 8 is going to be exactly what you expect, add wisdom to your cantrip damage. The pattern holds. However, this class does have one wild card. You're really going to want to know your DM, or at least have a talk with them. Your added spells are mostly divination, which is notoriously up to DM interpretation for their usefulness. And at level 17, you take a few minutes to meditate on the past. You gain important information on the previous owners of an item you're holding, or the area that you're in. Now I know that might sound situational at best, but it actually only goes back a couple days, so it's even worse. At least it's thematic. You are learning about the past, and these clerics are all about that learning, considering knowledge itself to be divine. Everything from librarians, to teachers, to keepers of an ancient tome. I suggest digging deep into the tropes of anyone who cares about truth for its own sake. An archaeologist, scientist, really just how most experts are actually like. Peel back all your notions of academia. Most of them are rapidly fixated on understanding their field to the core. Too focused to notice how reporters are twisting their words and their findings until it's too late. Is your character the type to be strung out on coffee in three days without sleep because they just have to figure out what's going on with this beetle inscription? Are they a noble who spent their fortune on expeditions? Their estate only used as a library? Because that is the adventuring knowledge cleric. Someone who wants to know more than the DM themselves, just for the sake of knowing. And you can do that too, with my totally unbiased channel. Hit that sub button, new video whenever I make a video, and that's a goblin guarantee. But now it's time for the most famous cleric, the best healer, the life domain. You want to prevent damage? You bet your bottom dollar you can. All of your bonus spells are preventing and undoing damage, plus you get heavy armor proficiency. Oh, you want healing? You know we got that healing. In fact, you heal extra. Add 2 plus spell level to all your healing spells. Not only that, but at level 6 you get that extra healing on yourself as well. And if that's still not enough for you, that same channeling that could repel the undead can heal for 5 times your level instead. And you can split that healing among anyone within 30 feet. You just can't heal in past half. But wait, there's more! At level 17, you don't roll for healing spells anymore. You just always heal maximum. The only thing they get that isn't healing or preventing damage is their level 8 extra radiant damage on weapon attacks. Look, if you chose life, you knew what you were signing up for. It's entirely healing based. The best healer around. Rare to get something with such a focused theme. The only surprising bit they have is the armor. Most of the flavor is going to be coming from your personality. Why and how you're healing. You could be the classic centaur for disease control, or really just play into your race in general and how your culture does healing. A goblin frantically dancing and yelling to attract our god's attention. Or a jaded human handing out medical waivers. Or an elf singing a solemn hymn to remind their god that if they lose, someone might think they aren't superior. Your revival spells are also necromancy, so you can just take that a step further. Play into the whole life manipulation theme as some sort of unnatural subversion of nature. Honestly though, I just play it straight. Double down on that whole light in the darkness and hope to the hopeless angle. Well, metaphorical light. If you want actual light, that's a completely different domain. I mean, technically they're also like truth and renewal and stuff, but their spells are almost entirely arson based. They do also get the light cantrip, and a few times a day they can turn themselves into a flashbang, give disadvantage to an attacker by flashing light in their eyes, and at level 6 you can even do this when people attack your friends, though I'm not sure why it took 5 levels to figure that one out. For a more potent version, use your channel divinity to cut through magical darkness and deal radiant damage to enemies around you, and to really double down on that anything within 30 feet must die energy? At level 17, you can start emitting bright light. Anything in that light has disadvantage against fire or radiant damage, especially potent because the pattern holds true. And given that the cleric's exclusive spell list includes both radiant damage cantrips, you're probably gonna have that. Between the radiant damage and your focus on killing it with fire, there's honestly very little that resists you. It does make sense, I mean you're probably channeling the sun itself. You're the only cleric who can answer disbelief with God's right there, she'll blind you if you look at her and gave me fireball. But while praise the sun is a very valid option, of course, there's a lot of things that emit light and heat. An old prospector that worships explosives. A cultist worshipping a volcano. It did mention renewal, so maybe you're a triton that worships those immortal bioluminescent jellyfish. You know, the ones that revert to polyp stage when they're starving or hurt, then mature back into adults when the coast is clear? Get creative with it. Speaking of jellyfish though, next up is nature. You may be thinking, wait a second, they get their power from reverence to nature gods? So do half the druids, what makes this different? Well, you know how some people will get so into a YouTuber or a streamer that they start caring more about them than the hobby? Yeah, that's the nature cleric. The druid is there for the forest, and they might see the god as an ally or a co-worker, but if push comes to shove, they're gonna choose the forest. Meanwhile, the cleric might love their lake, but they're really just here to champion their green goddess. They get a bunch of animal and plant themed spells, their choice of druid cantrip, and some nature themed skills. They can also wear plate mail. When channeling their god at level 2, they can charm animals and plants within 30 
sleeping. You can't control them though unless you're level 17, they're just charmed and friendly to you. At level 6 you can use your reaction to give resistance to acid, cold, fire, lightning, or thunder. And at level 8 they kinda break the mold, they still get the deal extra damage of a type ability, but this time you choose between cold, fire, or lightning damage every time you use it. That's honestly really useful. Very few things resist all three, mostly just beans and you don't run into those too often. If you're trying to play a nature loving mage and don't want to shapeshift, nature is pretty good. You get cool lips, sometimes situational utility. Now, of course I'm going to suggest you play a cleric of old man oak like he's an obsessed critical role fan, or a priest of the mother guardian of groves acting like she's a twitch streamer he's trying to protect the honor of, treating prayers like donations and gift subs. I don't know about you but I find that hilarious. I would also suggest making a veterinarian or a rep from the local animal rehab. You can make a pretty interesting character by focusing on natural healing. I mean with plants and divine magic of course, though I guess you could make one with salt lamps and healing crystals that actually work. Now I'm sure there's a good natural order segue in here somewhere, but for the life of me I cannot find it. So instead we get a blunt transition to the order domain. Your order cleric is lawful incarnate. I don't even mean that in the alignment way, they are literally just law. Follow the rules, the methods, the recipe, because that is the law. It's what keeps us whole in this chaotic universe, the means justifying the ends somehow. Your spells are themed around restraint and control, your abilities are based around barking orders, and you receive proficiency in intimidation or persuasion. Whenever you cast a spell on an ally, you can command them to attack a particular enemy, and they can follow your order as a reaction. Your channel at 2 lets you try and charm everyone within 30 feet, and order them to drop their weapon as you do. At level 6 you get even better at force compliance, and can cast leveled enchantment spells as a bonus action instead of an action. Your level 8 ability is the take extra damage type, this time with psychic damage, which is pretty rarely resisted, and at level 17 if an ally hits that same target before the start of your next turn, they take that psychic damage a second time. So the obvious character to make is a loving and peaceful one, they're just trying to get along with everyone, and they're just so hard to resist cause they're cute, and uh, yeah that's all I got for subversion. I have ideas that kinda work, but the forced compliance and mind control kinda nip them in the bud. There's only so many orderly ways I can go with that, maybe like an overbearing teacher or a boss? But honestly this one knows exactly what it wants to be and heavily resists stepping out of line, which is kinda fitting. This is a cop, a drill sergeant, a priest of a dictatorial cult or fascist regime, everyone from the well-intentioned caretaker who's genuinely trying to make the world a better place by eliminating the improper, to those jerks who follow me through the grocery store ranting about how shameful I am. But enough about why I pick up my groceries under cover of darkness. From your parents to the government, you probably already have more than enough examples in your life. Best I can think of is just ditching the order part entirely. Be some sort of Pied Piper character wandering around and collecting people. Sorry, I'm a chaotic goblin, I'm pretty biased. But I'm confident you can do something interesting with it. Just remember to pump the brakes in the control part when it comes to the party itself. In a very similar vein, we have the Peace Domain, something your DM is not going to have if you choose this. Because funnily enough, the one devoted to love and peace devastates combat with their support. It seems basic at first, you're proficient in a talkie skill and get some peaceful spells, healing and communication, even has the usual wisdom mod to cantrips at level 8. Your channel ability is really neat, you can run around without provoking attacks of opportunity, whacking your friends for a heal as you pass. But what sets the peace cleric apart is their bond ability. Level 1, a number of your allies are now bonded for 10 minutes. How many you can choose to be bonded and how many times a day you can bond people is equal to your proficiency modifier. As long as a bonded person is within 30 feet of another bonded person, they can add 1d4 to an attack, save, or check every turn. At level 6, when they're about to take damage, a bonded person who's in range can teleport to them and take the damage instead. And at level 17, that range becomes 60 feet and teleporting people take half damage. I don't like to get deep into mechanics on these, but your big damage dealer is getting an extra 5-20% to chance to hit on top of whatever support spells you want to cast, like Bless to do the same thing again. So they're basically always going to hit at least one attack, and when your tank just teleports to block whoever gets around your control spells, it gets a lot harder for the DM to actually do any lasting damage. In fact, don't even bother teleporting to them, attack yourself or touch your torch. Your surrounded wizard can just pop over to take that one fire damage. You are a phenomenal support to arbitrate your forced peace. That is what these are apparently for, watching treaty signings and settling disputes and helping those fight for peace. The question is whose peace? Because that matters a lot. You could be a freedom fighter, a negotiator, a business person who makes trade deals, a weird merchant whose caravan is impossible to rob, or the royal assassination squad. What? Things get very peaceful indeed when everyone who'd bite you is dead. You can definitely go 
show all love and hope and let's get along. But you can just as easily be about preemptive strikes and thought crimes and compliance. Send your team into strike like a bolt from the blue, as opposed to a bolt from the raging storm that is the Tempest Domain. Finally back in my comfort zone of just cool elemental powers, water, thunder, and lightning spells, you are the storm that is approaching in black clouds encroaching. You wear heavy armor, get martial weapons, and a few times a day you can clap back with thunder or lightning damage when you're hit. All of your lightning damage knocks people back at level 6, you get thunder or lightning damage whenever you attack at level 8, and your channel divinity can be used to maximize damage with thunder or lightning. Oh, and if you do make it to level 17, you can just fly whenever you're outdoors. You're meant to be the storm of destruction, and by Talos are you good at it. Now going to superheroes for inspiration is a given, but consider the other aspects of a storm to emulate. Maybe you're a wistful romantic knight, writing poetry about the calm which comes before and the beauty in its eye. Maybe you are a sailor and seek to sate the gods of the sea, invoking their name before violence to entertain them and spare your fellows. Or maybe Zeus just thinks you're hot and gave you powers as a gift, and you know enough to keep his favor but also watch your back, both for the wrath of another deity and just in case he tries something. Speaking of trickery, there are plenty of liars and pranksters among the gods. The trickery domain spell list focuses on changing your form, illusion, and just generally escaping the consequences of your actions. You can bring an accomplice too, giving an ally advantage on stealth checks for an hour, and you can do that as many times as you want, just not to more than one person at a time. Your channel divinity is among my favorites, letting you make an illusion of yourself. They have to stay in your line of sight and within 120 feet, but you can cast your spells through it, and since it's not real, it can't be hurt. So it can run in freely and use touch spells, or those dangerous area spells centered on the caster, all without you ever being in danger. And if you're in a pinch, you can both run up to a target to get advantage on the attack roll. And at level 17, you get four duplicates, letting you control a huge area. It's what you're going to be using near every channel on. I mean, technically, you do get another option at level 6. You turn invisible for one round, and it goes away if you attack or cast a spell. Woo. Anyway, you get that level 8 ability where you do extra damage with weapons, but this time with poison because you're tricky. Overall, I really like this one. The spells and channel make it really unique. You're a wonderful support that excels in all those weird touch spells, and you can actually help the whole party sneak. Being a thief priest is unexpected and fun, but you don't just have to be a magical rogue. You can be an actor, a liberator, a con artist, or a stage magician. Break into places as a form of worship, and if you're not a thief, just enjoy the thrill and turn everything 5 degrees to the right as a prank. It's great for everyone from freedom fighters to clowns. Because of course you can be a priest of the Dark Carnival. How do these clowns keep getting into every D&D video? Anyway, they aren't the only ones active at night. Twilight Domain is really more of a nighttime class. I guess darkness or moonlight just didn't sound as appealing. This domain is all about protecting those who wander the dark. Your spells are healing, buffs, and debuffs. Some of the best around too. And nothing is hiding in the darkness from your party. You get dark vision out to 300 feet. And you can share it with others for an hour. You can do it once a day for free. You can spend a spell slot to do it again if you you need to, and you'll be able to see in the dark better than the creatures who live there. You'll be bonking them before they even know you exist, because you can give yourself or someone else advantage on initiative. With heavy armor and martial weapons, you'll be blazing out of the dark before they even know what hit them. And I do mean darkness. You can share your dark vision because you don't want light around. You can just fly a few times a day if it's dim light or darker. You get the usual damage at level 8, this time radiant, solid option. But of course, your big thing is your channel divinity. You can make a dimly lit spear, 30 foot radius, and moves to keep you in the center. One minute duration and grants 1d6 plus wisdom of temporary HP to anyone you want who ends their turn there. And at level 17, it also grants half cover, which means plus 2 to AC and plus 2 to deck saves. So yeah, that is good. Providing the entire party or a generating HP shield is amazing, especially with your heals to undo what little gets through. So it's not only my favorite aesthetic, with some of my favorite goddesses like Selune and Enlistrae, it's a pretty powerful domain on its own, which is good. It was gonna be my favorite regardless. You can be a wandering protector, traveling the wilds to guard travelers, or a hunter stalking the night to destroy monsters who live there. You could be part of a sacred order, the truth behind a local legend of those who protect dreams. Be a vigilante fighting for love and justice. In the name of the moon, punish them. Or, there's nothing here that really demands you to be good. I would talk to your DM because this is the best cleric for a terror in the dark. Some things don't change. There will be shadow wherever there is light. And speaking of never changing, we finally have war. And yes, finally, number 14. I might make it out of this with a voice, unlike the first two times. I had to record this. Now obviously war works great for your average party. They're worshipping gods of battle and death. They get heavy armor and martial weapons of course, and their spells are a mix of damage, defense, and combat utility. They can also make an extra attack as a bonus action a few times a day. Good for finishing someone off or hitting an attack that you really need to. At level 2 you can hit plus 10 when you're trying to hit, and at 6 you can do that to a nearby ally. Great for when your wizard has a spell they just really need to hit. And speaking of hitting, your level 8 ability is the deal extra damage type, but it's the same type of damage as whatever type you're holding. And at level 17, you 
gain resistance to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. Basic, but great. Now a war god is pretty easy for a mercenary to worship, so I suggest flavoring it with your background and race. Do you worship by howling and charging in, letting the god flow through you? Or maybe you're a calm and focused teacher, filled with divine wisdom to help you guide your shot. Do you take trophies from your kills to prove your devotion? Or is war a necessary shame where you come from and you wear a mask and mourner's clothing to hide your deed from the world? And just like with all the other domains, look at the god you're worshipping and how their other domains affect how you act. The worship of a god of war and chivalry will look completely different from one of war and conquest or devastation or disease. Try to make the god themselves be incorporated into your action. Line up three clerics of the same domain and you should be able to tell if their gods are different. Whether you do that or not though, that is all of them. Is the cleric fun? Uh, yeah, probably. If you like casting and utility magic, they are a great choice, especially for support and control builds. But you can do all kinds of things. Just focus on whatever your domain focuses on and you can be pretty strong too. But if nothing here felt quite like what you're after, here's my suggestion. If you want more bonk, go paladin. To focus on magic, go sorcerer or bard. If you're looking for that flavor of getting your power from someone else, look at the warlock. And if you're the DM, use undead at least occasionally. The class is pretty focused on them, so throw them a bone, especially when they're at high level. I know it's hard to remember when we've just spent all this time on domains, but if you're level 16, all you've gotten for the past 8 levels are undead based abilities, better spell casting, or nothing. Except divine intervention, which I know is powerful in some campaigns, but in most campaigns I've been in or run, that in-game week might be multiple levels or out-of-game months. Don't get me wrong, the cleric is powerful, they just don't get much new past level 8. Anyway, like if you liked, sub if you haven't, and if you're particularly generous, you can leave me a tip on my coffee. The donations keep me running and growing. Top supporters this month are Feral Goblin and Sergeant Daniels. Anyway, class dismissed. Okay, so my big gripe with this class is that the god means nothing. Yeah, you heard me. What's the point? You don't even have to know who the god is, they can't affect you in any way, you get the same spells no matter what, and they use a standard spellcasting structure. So why bother locking it to a religion? Especially given how many people have ditched alignment by this point. Yeah, I know, hot take. But if you don't give me a limit, what do I have to build or buck against? I want decisions, consequences for my actions. Restriction can breed creativity. It could even be as simple as having to drop that god and switch to someone more aligned with my goals. My hotfix for this is adding little minor powers that are specific to whatever god you're worshipping, so if you anger them, you'll lose that power. You still keep your domain stuff because you're linked to that general realm and power source, but if you want those minor powers back, you're gonna have to play by that god's rules or find a new god who aligns with you better. Look, mechanics-wise, I love playing clerics, but flavor-wise, they're just a warlock with a complex. Anyway, my voice is dying, so BB out. See ya!